This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so we are continuing. Uh, last week, we began with, with the centrality of Israel to the Jewish people, and we are now continuing. And we were discussing about the, the, the physical, unique aspects of the land of Israel. And then we started to discuss the, the purpose of the land of Israel. And it's a place where we can perform mitzvot that don't apply anywhere else in the world. There are certain mitzvot that can only be performed. Much of the agricultural mitzvot are only, can only be performed in the land of Israel. We also discussed how the very walking, Arba Amot, four cubits, in the land of Israel is a mitzvah in and of itself. Starting with source 20, we're going to go into the idea that Israel is a place where the Jewish people and individual Jews can attain a certain level of, of spiritual growth that is not available not accessible elsewhere. <clears throat> so let's go to number 20 on the source sheet that I posted. And for those who asked me to send in the source sheets, and I do, it's the same source sheet that I sent out last week. Right? Last week we did one to 19, and now we are continuing with source number 20. Well, Chaim Friedlander in his Sifse Chaim writes as follows. We'll go straight to the English to save some time. The purpose of leaving Egypt was to receive the Torah. That the Torah tells us very clearly that Moshe told, uh, excuse me, that Hashem told Moshe, when you leave, you will, you will receive a great, uh, uh, afterwards they'll go out with a great treasure, and that was a reference to the Torah. And that's why, of course, we had the physical leaving of Egypt as our Pesach holiday, but that was linked by the 49 days of counting to make sure that we do link the physical exodus with the spiritual exodus, which was 49 days later with the holiday of Shavuot when we received the Torah. We received the land of Israel as an instrument or a means with which to fulfill the Torah. We have no other purpose in living in the land of Israel apart from this. The purpose is that it enables us to be greater Jews. He continues, the Jewish people did not receive the land of Israel in the same way that other nations need a piece of land to ensure their physical survival. The Jewish people were born in the desert after leaving Egypt. The Torah was given to us specifically, not in the land. As we discussed, Rabbi Sachs's view on this last week, I believe he mentioned that. We received the Torah there and were taken from there already as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We, were ready, we, we, we became this nation with the receiving of the Torah before we entered the land of Israel. We did not become a nation by settling together in the land of Israel, right? All other nations, the English, the French, the Italians, you name it. They settled the land together and thus became a people. We did not become a nation by settling together in the land of Israel. We were already a nation with the exodus of Egypt and most importantly with the receiving of the Torah. Rather, on the contrary, through our being a unified nation, we receive the Torah. That's a famous, beautiful teaching. The, the verse says, Vayichan Yisrael, Ahar, that says that we camped. But Vayichan, for those who have the Hebrew uh, nuances, Vayachanu is the plural, and they camped. Vayichan is the singular. In English, we have camped, and it's the same term that's used, whether for the plural or the singular. Hebrew is a lot more exact. So it could have said, should have said, Vayachanu, and they camped by the foot of the mountain. It says Vayichan in the singular. 
Ki'ish echad belev echad, like one person with this absolute unity. So we did, right? On the contrary, through our being a unified nation, we received the Torah. Then we remained in the desert for 40 years, eating manna. And only after all this did we receive an additional instrument with which to fulfill the Torah, and that is the land of Israel. And he continues elsewhere, quoting from our Aleinu prayer. The Aleinu prayer is what we say at the end of each and every davening. That's how central it is. But actually, as we know, it is drawn from our Rosh Hashanah davening. Rosh Hashanah, the, the most focal point of the year, arguably, right? Maybe Yom Kippur, maybe Purim, there's a whole other discussion. But Rosh Hashanah is certainly a focal point of the year. And Musaf prayer of Rosh Hashanah is a focal point of Rosh Hashanah. And one of the central parts of the Musaf on Rosh Hashanah is the Aleinu. And because of its importance and prominence, it was taken from there and said at the end of each and every davening. So the Siddhi Chaim comments for us, uh, source number 21, on the phrase in the Aleinu, Shalo Asanu Kigoyeha Ratzot, he has not made us like the nations of the land, like the nations of the other lands. Certainly the land of Israel is for us a wondrous instrument. It is a kli a vessel, an instrument, a tool, and means with which to serve God in a perfect way by means of the mitzvot that can only be done in the land and because of its special holiness. So we have, first of all, the mitzvah that can only be done there, and there is this total upgrade, this general upgrade with all the mitzvot that are performed there. The perfection that one can achieve in the land of Israel is not possible outside it. On the other hand, but nevertheless, the existence of the Jewish people is not dependent on their being in the land of Israel, right? We were outside of Israel uh, in a communal sense for thousands of years. When we are exiled from the land of Israel and dwell in other countries, we remain the same nation of God as we were while living in the land of Israel. So it's not a requirement, it was not a prerequisite to our nationhood, and it's not required for our continuing nationhood, but it does give us this completely different level of living, of fulfilling mitzvot, and being a Jewish people. This certainly finds its way when it comes to Torah study, and there are two very famous quotes about Israel and Torah study that Rav Dessler, Rav Eliel Dessler, in his classic Michtav Meliahu, uh, delves into and explains. One such statement is, Ein hato, ein Torah, ketorot eretz Yisrael. There is no Torah study like that of the land of Israel, and more generally, Avira de Ara de Yisrael Machkim, that the very air of the land of Israel, Machkim, helps to make a person a Chacham. It grants, it grants wisdom, it grants perspective, it grants a, a, a deeper, a deeper understanding. And uh, personally, I was able to to uh, experience this, that uh, after not having been the most uh, attentive and serious uh, Jewish studies uh, student, as I made my way through uh, grade school and high school, but once I went to Israel post high school for a gap year that ended up being two gap years, I really devoted myself to, to my studies. To, to Gemara, to Talmud, and to all the Jewish studies. And at the end of my second year, before returning back to the States, 
I went to an Israeli yeshiva, a high level Israeli yeshiva. And I was paired up with one of the boys there. And I was amazed and very gratified to see that I was able to learn, study with this chavruta, with this study partner as equals, even though he had been a kid who had been studying seriously since probably third or fourth grade when he began. And I had only really started to do it seriously when I was 17 years old uh, in Israel post high school. But uh, I, I, I felt that the, the Torah of Eretz Yisrael and the Avira to Eretz Yisrael, the Torah of Israel and the heir of Israel allowed me to uh, catch up, to catch up on many years that I had not taken it so seriously. And there I was with someone else my age and uh, able to hold my own. Rav Dessler explains it as follows. Let's see source number 24. Based on the above two sources, Rav Dessler comments, one who engages in Torah study in the land of Israel is assisted greatly by God. We call that siyata dishmaya. Siyata dishmaya is the Aramaic siyata, the help, the push dishmaya from the heavens and receives a unique flow of spiritual energy. Hashpa'a miyuchedet, a very special, unique flow. In our generation, we see firsthand how young people are developing and growing through engaging in Torah in the land of Israel. They ascend in their studies. They are successful acquiring knowledge in all areas of the Gemara, of the Talmud, and they accomplish much more than they would have in Torah institutions outside of the land of Israel. And like I said, I could, uh, I could personally attest to that. He ends off with a supplication, with a hope and a prayer. May the Holy One pour assistance upon us and give us resources like the land of Israel. Let us prepare ourselves to be fitting recipients of this assistance and not underestimate its value. Rather, in our growth in Torah and awareness of God, may we utilize such assistance to its full extent. Okay? So, really, we've been speaking about in a very spiritual sense. I think many of us, many of us look to the land of Israel as a, as a refuge, as a place where Jews will always be welcome especially looking back on our uh, difficult history when many gates of other countries were closed to us in our times of the most dire need. And, and that's true. I believe that is true. You know, um, my father-in-law, whenever there's a rise in anti-Semitism, he always says, check your passports, check your passports. Right, make sure that we can get to Israel if we need to. Right? And there is, there is a certain truth to that. At the same time, I think it's important to note that with the establishment of the state of Israel, many thought we'll now be like a nation like all the other nations. And that will be the end of uh, anti-Semitism. We'll now be a nation like all other nations. And certainly here we are, 2021, uh, it's 70 plus years since the, found, the founding of the state of Israel. And some will argue that, well, I think, I think we can safely say that much of the anti-Semitism has morphed into anti-Israel, anti-Zionism, and that's really just been a cloak through which the classic anti-Semitism now, crou now crouches and hides. And, and how it's simply a cloak 
was clearly shown during the past few weeks when in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Jews were hunted down. It wasn't Zionists who were who who they went into restaurants to try to find. It was Jews. So as much as Israel does serve as a haven, we need to recognize that we are in an interim, a very interim stage of, and we've taken, God has granted us incredible steps with the return to Israel, the sovereignty in Israel, an incredible ingathering of exiles to Israel, but it's not yet where it needs to be. And we are taking, like I said, great steps towards this ultimate redemption, but we're clearly not quite there yet. Without, without any lack of appreciation for where we've gotten to, appreciation to God and to all those who sacrificed so much for us to be where we are at now. Rav Hirsch. Rav Hirsch, of course, was one of the great rabbis in Germany. And Germany is where the reform uh, began and was and was flourishing. And he was a bulwark, bulwark against this reform, an eloquent speaker and defender of Judaism as it had been practiced for all time. He writes in source number 25. The Jewish nation is to represent agriculture as well as commerce, militar militarism, culture, and learning. Meaning we're meant to be a nation there in Israel. And we certainly have, have blossomed into that, leading, uh, be, be, becoming a leading nation whether it is in agriculture, commerce, militarism, in mostly in defense, and in when, have to, when having to bomb, making sure to, to come up with this concept of the, the knock that precedes it, to warn civilians and others to get out, even though that also warns the terrorists to get out. And learning. The Jewish people be a nation of farmers, of businessmen, of soldiers and of science right he's writing this uh, in the 1800s mind you and he is spot on with what we have become thereby as a model nation to establish a truth that the one great personal and national task which god revealed in his torah is not dependent on any particular kind of talent or character trait, for that the whole of humanity in all its shades of diversity can equally find its calling in one common spiritual and moral mission and outlook in life. It's not only the scholars or only the soldiers or only the, the farmers. No, it's everyone. Together, we all can attain this spirituality. And then that is meant to be this guiding light to the nations, that it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, where you're from, but all, all can attain this spirituality, this connection to God. And that's something that I've mentioned a number of times, that to me, one of the most beautiful I don't want to call it proofs that aren't proofs, but a very beautiful indication of a very a real beauty of Judaism. And to me, a very clear validation of its truth is that it doesn't make sense to say that the God of the universe and of all humanity will only accept one way of serving him. And everyone's either has to accept Jesus, everyone has to. Uh, except Muhammad as the prophet. And if you don't do that, then eternal damnation. That makes no sense whatsoever. What does make sense is that there could be a, a group who were given added, added restrictions, added pathways to connect to God. 
which is the 613 mitzvot, but at the same time, there is a pathway for all humanity to connect to God, regardless of their being Jewish or not. The Kuzari, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, he writes in source number 26, this land which was designated for the purpose of rectifying the entire world was set aside as an inheritance for the tribes of the sons of Israel after the generation of the dispersion, the Tower of Babel. This is what is meant by the verse when the Supreme One gave the nations their inheritance. When he separated the children of men, he set the borders of the peoples. And this is, again, a very, very important point for us to know and be willing to share. Many different nations were given their land. It's not, we're not saying only the Jews have a land that's designated for them. Throughout the scripture, we were commanded, don't go into the boundaries of this land. That was given to the nation of Ammon. That was given to Moab. That, those are their lands. And we simp and and as I mentioned many times, the only nation that ever had Jerusalem as its capital city ever in all of time is the Jewish people. The Ottomans, it was not their main city. The British, it was not their main city. The Romans, it was not their main city. The only nation that ever had Jerusalem and Israel as their main place, as their only place, is the Jewish people. I just recently read, I forget where I saw this. That the, I believe it was the Israeli ambassador to Vietnam shared that the foreign ministers of Vietnam had shared with him that for decades, the Palestinians had been coming to them saying, you managed to expel the Americans and they managed to expel the French and they managed, how can we expel the Jews? And the response that they were given is, when we expelled the Americans, they went back to America. When we expelled the French, they went back to France. Over here in Israel, we are protecting our families, our men, women, and children. And there is no other place for us to go back to. That is our place. We're willing to share it peacefully with those who would like to live with us in peace. Just don't shoot bombs at our civilians. Not too much. Not too much, not such a great demand, is it? Number 27 of Mordechai Becker's Gateway to Judaism. I mentioned this over and over. This is on the reading list for those who are converting and uh, highly recommended for those who are not converting, all those Jews who are born Jews, right? Uh, this is uh, excellent, excellent. In his Gateway to Judaism, he writes, the tremendous media scrutiny of Israel and the extraordinary amount of attention paid to this tiny country in the Middle East may well be due to the fact that deep down, people expect something more of Israel and the Jews. There is a sense that the state of Israel should have higher standards than its neighbors in the rest of the world. And indeed it should. This idea is beautifully expressed in the following verse in the book of Isaiah, Yeshayo. And many nations will go and say, let us go and ascend to the mountain of God, to the temple of God of Jacob. We'll be instructed in his ways. We walk in his paths. He meets Sion, Tetzay Torah, Udvar Hashem, Mirushalayim. From Zion shall come forth the Torah and the word of God for, from Jerusalem. Israel is supposed to be the place to which people of the world look for guidance, guidance in moral behavior. So we are held to a higher standard. And even though it might not be for the world to hold us to a higher standard, it is for us to hold ourselves to a higher standard. 
and I believe militarily Israel does. The, the head of UNRWA in the Gaza Strip, who's no, uh, no partial observer, spoke about the precision of the bombing. Now, of course, there needs to be, right? And then, of course, he got slammed and said, every civilian, every civilian is precious and cannot be, and, uh, and there's no excuse for. Well, yes and no, right? If people are shooting bombs from behind civilians and the choice is either to allow our civilians to be killed or to take out the bomb running the risk, the bomb and the bombers running the risk of civilians. Yeah. So if civilians anyhow are, are going to be harmed, we need to do our best to avoid it, and we do, as opposed to those who are sending their bombs indiscriminately, hoping, focusing, aiming towards civilians. Okay. Let's go now to section four. The spiritual qualities of the land of Israel. And once again, we go to Rav Dessler. And this is an idea that, you know, what makes a shul a holy place? We designate it as a place of worship, a place of tefillah, of prayer, a place of mitzvot. We designate it as such. That's what gives 3,900 Michelson a degree of holiness that you might not find out 2,900 Michelson, whatever that might be. I'm not speaking disparagingly. I don't know what it is. But any other place we have, that is, what, that is the place that we focus and dedicate for this service to God. But Israel is actually a little bit different. The land of Israel is actually different. It's not that we designate it as such, but that it was designated as such. Famously, when God said to Abram, to Abraham, Lech Lecha, go from your land to the land, birthplace, to the land, El Arzashar Eka, to the land that I will show you. So according, so and then it says, Abram started going towards the land of Canaan. How did he know? <laughs> how did he know how to go? So some learned simply that, well, that was at a later point, God told him and, that, and then he started going that direction. But others explain, Avram knew, if I'm going to a place for spiritual growth, where will I go? I'll go to the land of Canaan. That was known as the place of spirituality. That's why the idolatry there was stronger than elsewhere. Because idolatry is nothing more than a perverted lust for spirituality. And when one goes in the wrong direction, it translates into idolatry. So Rav Desler writes, Ma niflahu. How amazing is it? Ze alpayim shana shegalinu me'artseinu. 2,000 plus years. Exiled from our land. The Ech Nish Ara Avata Bilibenu. How is it that our love for it has remained so strong, so strongly in our hearts? Yan ki ain zo it's lena lumiut kama it's a lamim. This land the answer to the land does not represent the center of our nationality the way it does for other nations. If that were the case, the Holy Land would already have been forgotten like other nations who forgot their homeland after long periods of exile. You know, we, we have many other lands that were, that were offered, that were offered to us as a place for our homeland. Like, why go to the Middle East, right? It's, it, it's, such a, it, it's such a tough neighborhood, right? Parts of Africa were offered. That would have gone well. Rather, the love for the land is rooted in its Kedusha, in holiness. 
The holiness of this land in which God is readily found is the same holiness that is inside of us. It is an inheritance in our souls, right? It is that Yerusha that is in our souls, which we received from Avraham after he overcame the test of Lech Lecha, leaving his home, birthplace, and his country. So there is a Kedusha in us, a holiness in us, there is a holiness in the land. And that is what gives this deep spiritual connection that we have to this land that even after being out of it for thousands of years, our longing for it, our connection to it never, never stopped. The famous Medrash Rabbah, source number 29, Rav Acha said, Le'olam ein ha zaza me'kotel ha'maravi. The shechina never moves from, I, they say we'll never leave, but I think it's stronger, a better translation, zaz is to move. It never moves from the Kotel Maravi. To me, never moving speaks of a greater uh, permanence, a greater consistency than to say never leaves. Right? A person says, I'll never leave Irvine. Doesn't mean they won't go to Tustin to do some shopping. Doesn't mean they won't travel to elsewhere to visit relatives, but they'll never leave. But never move, that has a whole different connotation. That's actually the definition. Zazas to move. Behold, he stands right there behind our wall. That's Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs. And that, he says, is a deeper reference to what we refer to as the, the Kotel, the wall. And once again, Rav Freelander writes, or hashchina betikunohu makom kvoda batzilut ad eretz Yisrael. Quoting from the Dat Vunot the Ramchal, the place for the revelation of the light of the Shechina. Remember, we discussed every name of God is a different aspect of His relationship. Shechina comes from Shachain. Shachain is a neighbor or a dweller. The Shechina is that aspect of Hashem's presence which is felt in this world. The place for the revelation of the light of the Shekhinah, presence of God, in its complete form, is in the land of Israel. The root of the revelation comes from a high spiritual level, and the effect of this revelation is manifested in the land of Israel. One of my uh, rabbis, one of my rabbis, once said that De Denver might be the mile high city which means the earth might be closer to the heavens. But he said in Jerusalem, the heavens are closer to the earth. I'd like that way of describing it. And once again, Rav Huda Levin, Sefer Kuzari, right, source number 31, points out, Gama datot sheboach Those Those two great world religions that came after, after Judaism, right? when they acknowledge the truth and do not deny it, then they attach great significance to this place. They say, this is the place of prophets, Shar Shamayim, gates to heaven. Makoma Mishpata Harutz, a place of justice. All right, this is an important point. For Islam, Mecca is the Mecca, is the great, great, great holy place. What does Mecca mean to Judaism? Nothing. What does Mecca mean to Christianity? To the best of my knowledge, nothing. Bethlehem, 
Oh, Bethlehem, that to uh, Christian, Christians is the great place. What does that mean to Islam? Nothing. What does it mean to Judaism? Nothing. Jerusalem is our holy place. What does it mean to Christianity? A lot. What does it mean to Islam? Also a lot. And keep in mind that Jerusalem is not mentioned by, uh, by name once in the entire, entire Quran. Nevertheless, um, they say that when it speaks about their prophets ascend to heaven, right, from, I've got the exact wording of it. So many scholars say that that's referring to Jerusalem. Other Muslim scholars disagree and interpret it differently. Okay. A concept that we often talk about is Hashkacha Pratis, divine providence, divine orchestration, how things happen for a reason. I was talking to somebody this morning who's going through a tough time, a tough time medically. And the person said, uh, I know God has a reason for it. And that's really, that's really how we view, how we view all events not being haphazard, but there being divine orchestration. Our Tuesday morning class, we discussed uh, the, the, the words in the parsha in this week's Torah reading, Al pi Hashem yachanu, Al pi Hashem yisu. By the direction of God, we camped. By the direction of God, we traveled. And that's not just talking about the children of Israel in the desert. That's talking about as we each make our own trek through the the life that is gifted to us, and we end up sometimes in strange places, didn't expect to be there, right? Difficult situations. We recognize this idea of Ashkacha Pratis, divine orchestration, divine supervision. Alpi Hashem Yachanu, Alpi Hashem Yisu. And that is very true, but it's most easily recognized. <laughs> in the land of Israel. And that's a passage in Devarim, Deuteronomy, source number 32. It says there, Eretz, the land, Asher Hashem Lekecha Doresh Ota, that God is always scrutinizing it. That's a good translation. Tamid, always. Tamid, Ne Hashem Lekecha Ba, the eyes of God are always upon it. Me Reshit Hashana, Vanacharit Hashana. Beginning of the year till the end of the year, there is this um, divine, intense scrutiny. And once again, Rav Freelander in the Sitte Chaim, source number three, 33, excuse me, explains, I'll take it in English. It is true that the eyes of God are focused on the entire world. Nevertheless, compared to the rest of the world, we recognize God's personal intervention in everyday affairs, <clears throat> Hashkacha Pratit, in a more pronounced fashion in the land of Israel. That is what, what is meant by the verse, the eyes of Hashem are always there. <clears throat> this is a special power of the land of Israel. There is the opportunity for greater closeness to the Holy One. And it teaches us about God's intervention in everyday affairs. For this reason, <coughs> excuse me, prophecy is only possible in the land <clears throat> in the land of Israel. Okay, that's Rambam rules that. Ram, Ramban, excuse me, on Devarim, says, <clears throat> source number 34, Navi v'kirvacha me'achacha kamoni, tami kirvacha, when it says from your midst, it means, ein nevuah el of Eretz Yisrael. Prophecy is only in the land of Israel. Bring me a proof for that. Bring me a proof from that, from one of our prophets. When he wanted to uh, release himself from the onus of a prophecy he didn't want to give, what did Yonah, what did Jonah do? Boarded a ship to leave the land of Israel. Yeah. And once again, the Kuzari says, 
anyone who had prophecy only had it inside the land of Israel or for the sake of Israel. Rabbi Arya Kaplan explains further, since prophecy requires the highest degree of sanctification, well, that highest degree could only be attained in the land of Israel. It is thus written, God, your Lord will raise a prophet in your midst. That's what the Ramban had said before. Prophecy would only take place in the land of Israel when it is settled by the Israelites. A prophet can therefore only obtain his first revelation in the Holy Land. However, he can later obtain a vision even in other lands, provided that is necessary for the sake of Israel. Even in such cases, however, the vision could, not, only, could only be attained in a secluded place, a valley near a river, which is not contaminated by the general populace. Moreover, prophecy can only exist in the Holy Land when it is inhabited by the majority of Israelites in the world. Interesting. It was not that long ago that Israel, right? For a while now, Israel has had a greater amount of Jews than any other country, right? United States was up there and Russia was up there until the Iron Curtain opened and then many, many, many of the Jews fled. But it's only more recently that Israel is the place where majority of the world Jews are, right? Where majority of the world Jews are there. And he says that is actually a prerequisite for the continuation of prophecy. Therefore, when the majority of Israelites refused to return to the Holy Land in, in the time of Ezra, the land ceased to have its special status with respect to prophecy, and prophecy ceased to exist. However, it will be restored in the Messianic age when the majority of Israelites once again live in the Holy Land. And again, that's just another indication of, of the steps that we are taking towards that point. So let's go to our last section, which is the land of Israel in the pre-Messianic era, where we are right now. And Devarim Deuteronomy, once again, chapter Lamed, chapter 30. Vishav Hashem Elokecha et Shavutcha. And the Lord your God will return your, you from your captivity. Berichamecha, and have compassion upon you. Vishav, Vikibetcha, he will return. And once again, from the Hebrew, uh, from the English, you don't get the full power of this. Because the first word, Vishav, if I'm acting on something else, if I'm bringing you back, I would say, Veheshiv, I will bring you back. Grammatically, Vishav is God himself will return. From that, we have the teaching that when we are in exile, the divine presence is there with us also. So God will gather you back from all the nations, bring you to the land that your fathers inherited. It doesn't say occupied. It says, right, Yarshu. It says inherited. V'yirishta, and you will inherit it. Ve'itivcha, and make it more prosperous, more numerous than your fathers. Yecheskel also, the, the, the prophet Ezekiel, speaks about, l'chein ko amar Hashem. This is Hashem say the people, thus says God, I will assemble you from the nations, gather you in from the lands where you've been scattered, and I'll give you the land of Israel. And again, we've certainly seen uh, great, great stages and steps of this having taken place. Right, that of course uh, constitutes the bracha that we're going to now discuss, the blessing in our Amida, source number 39. Right, that bracha paraphrases the words from Yechesko. Sound the great shofar of our freedom. Raise the banner to gather in all of our exiles. The Kabetzenu and group us together. Kibbutz, bring us together. Yachad, together. Me arba, kanfota aretz. Interesting. Kabetzenu, yachad. There's a duality there. Don't just bring us in 
and we'll all be there, but bring us in yachad. Let us be as one. Let us feel that kinship, that brotherhood, that, that, that oneness with, with all the other Jews. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, mekabetz nidchei amo Yisrael, the one who gathers the dispersed of his people, Israel. And almost lastly, and we'll have one more after this, Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan, one of the most important traditions regarding the Messianic era concerns the ingathering of the diaspora and the resettlement of the land of Israel. There are numerous traditions that the Jewish people begin to return to the land of Israel as a prelude to the Messiah. The ingathering will begin with a measure of political independence, that's the Gemara Sanhedrin, and according to some, with the permission of other nations, Ramban, Shir Hashirim, right? and certainly it was the UN vote that first uh, sanctioned, which came uh, uh, upon an agreement of the League of Nations in the 1920s. As the holiest spot in the land of Israel, Jerusalem is the most important city that must be rebuilt there. There is a tradition, a teaching, that the ingathering of the exiles and the rebuilding of Jerusalem will go hand in hand as the two most important preludes to the coming of the Mashiach. According to this tradition, first a small percentage of the exiles will return to the Holy Land, then Jerusalem will come under Jewish control and be rebuilt. Only then will the majority of Jews in the world return to their homeland, which is actually exactly what happened after 67. That's when there was this, this greater rush of Jews returning home. It is thus written, God is Bone Yerushalayim, Mikabetz Nidche Yisrael, builder of Jerusalem, gatherer of the dispersed in that order as we have seen it. And we will conclude with the very last quote from our Haggadah, which is Lishana Haba, Bi Yerushalayim Habinuya. May next year, may we all be there together in the fully rebuilt Jerusalem. Not just the physically rebuilt, but the spiritually rebuilt, which goes hand in hand. And that, as we say, is the beating heart of the Jewish people that is as, center, as, any, as central as anything can be to anyone that is the land of Israel to us. And uh, I mentioned last week, right, one of the wonders of Jewish history is that the, the prophecies that we will return to the land of Israel and that the desert will bloom. And that is exactly what we have seen. We have hardships, we have struggles along the way. We've certainly seen that and experienced that and lived that. But uh, ultimately, Lashan Abba, Yushalayim Habinuya. We are part of a great uh, history, a great trajectory that the prophets have already all laid out for us. We see its fulfillment and we keep doing our best to bring as much good and holiness to the world that the subsequent steps should follow through and happen. speedily in our days. And I think it'll be a nice lunch and learn to go through one time. We'll go through the the seven uh, the seven wonders of, of of Jewish history, of Jewish history and prophecy. I think that'd be a nice thing for us to go through. But um, next week, though, we'll start a little bit on getting uh, starting to unpack uh, anti-Semitism and understanding it, seeing how it's manifested and seeing where we can go with that. Okay, my friends, feel free to unmute if you'd like to add anything. Otherwise, we will sign off over here. Good seeing everybody. And um, we'll see. We have a, uh, a medical advisory committee. And hopefully, once, um, I think, in the middle of June is when the restrictions are supposed to be lifted. We'll see, you know, how we can 
um, implement that in the shul, keeping everybody safe and healthy, but also getting ourselves back to where we need to be. And it'd be very nice to be able to do this in person. I'm hungry, no one got to eat, it's a problem. We still call it lunch and learn, but I could be uh, sued for false advertising. Okay, my friends, those who can join us, uh, 6.15 tomorrow, we have Mincha Kabbalat Shabbat, and um, Saturday night, where are we? We'll have a musical Havdalah at about 5 to 9, 8.55. All are welcome to join. Be well, my friends. Rabbi, that was wonderful.